Oh, okay, so uh, our next speaker is Dilara Koswa uh, from uh, Boğaziçi University, and she will talk about categorical formulation of topological quantum field trees. Okay, Dilara, it's all yours. Thank you, Ikerajan. So, uh, as you can understand, I will be talking about category theoretical formulation of topological quantum field theories. So, let me first talk about my uh, main references. Me and my mentor, Ilker Hoca, actually covered this book by J. Koch, Fermi's Algebras and 2D Topological Quantum Field Theories. So this presentation will basically be a summary of some of his chapters. And since I don't have much time, I will be omitting all of the proofs, and I won't very much go into detail. If anyone's interested, you can read this book. Also, historically, the idea of a TQFT was first introduced by Edward Witten in late 1980s, I suppose, 88. And then uh, mathematical axioms was first given by uh, Michael Atia in this paper here, Topological Quantum Field Theories. So this is still one of the most influential papers in the area. I just included this one. There are of course lots of other important, important ones. Okay, so this will be the uh, overview. We will first talk about cobordisms and some differential topology. And then uh, I'll go on to state Atia's axioms of TQFT, and then we will make sense of them. Uh, afterwards, we will be needing some vocabulary from category theory, so we will discuss some uh, category theoretical definitions. And then finally, I will be able to give the category theoretical definition of a TQFT. So the main purpose of this presentation is just to restate at the Atiyah's axioms using a, just a sentence and category theory. Okay, so we will be talking about field theories and uh, of course, there will be the idea of time and start and finish will be important. These concepts will actually be important. Also in category theory, we will be talking about arrows and arrows will be going from somewhere to another place. So we want this same idea to be kind of implemented on our manifolds as well. How do we do that? We just classify its boundaries. So let M be a, a topological manifold with boundary and let sigma be its a boundary. So we take a point on that boundary and look at the positive basis for its time space, then a vector W will be called a positive normal if when we add that W to those spanning set, then it will be a positively oriented basis for the whole manifold. And if that W is pointing inwards, then uh, this boundary will be called in boundary. If it points outwards, it will be called out boundary. So I can explain it a little bit with a picture. So we have a cylinder here. Uh, it has two boundaries, two S1s here and here. So let us assume the positive orientation on this manifold to be I hat pointing right and J hat pointing up. So uh, let us investigate this as one first. So let's say the positive orientation on this one is just J hat. Then we need to add, of course, I hat in order to have a positive basis for the whole manifold. And I hat is pointing inwards here and it will be pointing outwards here. So this will be an in boundary and this will be an out boundary. Of course, we can do lots of other variations. We can reverse the orientation on one of the uh, boundaries. So here we have such a situation. Uh, so this sigma bar denotes the reverse oriented sigma. So when we do that, then the, the positive normal will be pointing inwards here too. So we will actually have two in boundaries and no out boundaries. Just for convention, we draw it like this. So all the in boundaries are on the left side and uh, out boundaries are on the right side. And here I wrote something that I didn't quite define yet. Just to discuss this symbol, this is the symbol of disjoint union, and it's different from set union because uh, we label all those elements. Uh, or, you know, mathematically, we can say from sigma, there's an inclusion map to this uh, uh, sigma, disjoint union sigma bar. And this M, let's say this whole manifold is called M, this M's in boundary is sigma, disjoint union sigma bar, and its uh, out boundary is just the empty space. So this M is actually a cobordism, and oriented cobordism from sigma zero to sigma one is a compact oriented manifold M, such that uh, from sigma zero, there is a diffeomorphism uh, from, to the in boundary of M, and from sigma one, there's a diffeomorphism to the out boundary of M. So you can say the M's in boundary is diffeomorphic to sigma zero, and out boundary is diffeomorphic to sigma one. And if there is such an M, then uh, this sigma zero and sigma one will be uh, called cobordant. And actually this relation gives an equivalence relation. And when we quotient this on the uh, on closed oriented M minus one manifolds, then we get a group and this group is actually very important in differential topology, but I won't very much go into detail because that's not my area of interest right now. So uh, let us have an example. This is a cylinder cobordism, the most basic cobordism actually. So here, sigma zero is diffeomorphic to this in boundary, sigma, and sigma one is diffeomorphic to this out boundary. So we can say sigma zero and sigma one are uh, cobordant uh, via this cylinder cobordism. 
And actually, this cylinder is, of course, topologically this. And these two will be in the same class, in the class of cylinder properties. Okay, so uh, now I need to talk about decomposition. So let M be a cobordism. How do we decompose it? Uh, we define a map on M going to the unit interval, and we will cut it uh, along the inverse image of some arbitrary T here, let's say sigma T. And we orient sigma T such that the positive normal of sigma T is, will be pointing towards the outbound. Uh, why do we do that? Because then we will get we will be getting two cobordisms. One is from zero to T and other ones from T to one. And this sigma t will be serving as the out boundary of the first one and the in boundary of the second one. Okay. So now we are ready to state uh, Atiyah's axioms. So there are actually five of them. I will be I will consider them one, one by one, and uh, we will try to make sense of what what it all means. Okay. So an n-dimensional TQFT is a rule A. What does this rule do? So let's say we have a cobordism uh, going from sigma zero to sigma one. So this A maps uh, this closed oriented M minus one manifolds, the boundaries to vector spaces. So here in this case, sigma zero is mapped to V and sigma one is mapped to W. And the cobordism between them will be mapped to a linear map between these two vector spaces. So this is what the rule does. And it of course satisfies some axioms. Let us investigate those. So the first one, two equivalent cobordism must have the same image, just guarantees that TKF is well-defined. Because as I mentioned, we will be talking about cobordism classes and we want this map to be well defined. And of, also, the cylinder thought of as a cobordism from sigma to itself must be sent to the identity map. So, uh, with the cylinder uh, construction, its in boundary and out boundary uh, are actually the same thing. I mean, they are diffeomorphic with the cylinder. So, uh, we want this to go to V, and this will, of course, go to V again. We want the map between them, uh, the, co Im the image of the cobordism, to be the identity map. And also, this is very important. So let's say we de decompose the cobordism into two parts, M1 and M2. Then we want TKFT to respect this decomposition. Uh, what do I mean? So let's say you know these are mapped to these respected vect uh, vector spaces. Then M will be a cobordism from sigma 0 to sigma 2. So it will actually be linear map from V to U. And we want this linear map to be G composed with F. So it will, uh, so TQFT will respect decomposition and composition of linear maps. And, uh, and we also want the disjoint union to go to tensor product. Okay, so I forgot to mention the physical intuition behind. Let me just uh, go back a few pages. So these are M minus one manifolds. And you can think of, for them as space, the M between the uh, manifold can be thought of as space time. So we map this uh, spaces to state spaces, uh, normal vector spaces, and we map space time uh, to the linear time uh, linear time evolution operator between the state spaces. So uh, for this one, you can also think of as uh, for people. Next then uh, the whole systems uh, vectors is actually their individual uh, individual vector spaces tensor product. So this basically represents that same idea and its mathematical importance will be clear when we talk about category theory. And also the empty manifold must be sent to the ground field K. As I said, this is also very important, but it will be clear when we talk about monoidal categories and so on. Okay, so we have uh, two important results. Uh, let A be a TQFT, then the image vector space V of a closed manifold sigma comes equipped with a non-degenerate pairing with W, which is the image of the reverse sigma. So uh, just from linear algebra, we know this is actually a canonical isomorphic to the dual of V. And if we have such a non-degenerate pairing, then uh, we can deduce that actually all these vector spaces are of finite dimension. So when we are dealing with TQFT, uh, all of our image vector spaces are just finite dimension. This is not the case with other field theories. You can be dealing with you know, infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces and so on, but this is a single law. So in TQFT, there are only finite dimensional ones. Okay. So now we are ready to talk about category theory. I will be very brief uh, on all the uh, definitions, but here category is a set of following data. 
okay, so okay, we have a collection of objects and we have a set for these two objects, there will be morphisms between X to Y. So we have an object, we choose two of them, ordered pair, then the set home C X Y will be the set that contains all the morphisms, all the arrows, or you like, if you like, going from X to Y. And we will have a function, which is the, uh, which is usually not by this uh, little circle. And it will go from the, okay, so it takes two inputs. It takes a function, no function. It takes a morphism going from X to Y, and it takes a morphism going from Y to Z, and it maps it to a morphism going from X to Z. So this will actually be composition. The morphisms going from X to X, such that when we compose any F uh, with this identity, then it will give us F again. And if, if we have, uh, if we have such three morphisms in these three separable sets, then we also want them to satisfy associated with it. So these are all the axioms of a category. When we have all those, we have a category. So let me give some examples. And these are very elementary examples. You can check uh, that they all actually satisfy all the axioms. So in the category of sets, we have objects as sets and morphisms are just functions from one set to another, nothing very important or difficult. The composition is the usual composition. So of course it satisfies associated with them. And uh, we have the category of abelian groups, then the morphisms will be group homomorphisms and the composition will be just composition of homomorphisms. And we, we have the category of k-vector spaces. Then this time morphisms will be linear maps because they are the ones that preserving the vector space uh, construction and composition will be composition of linear maps. And in the category of topological spaces, we have continuous maps as morphisms and composition is just the usual composition. So we also need the idea of a functor. Uh, so given two categories, we want uh, something to relate them and a functor does that job. So a functor is a, basically a function mapping all the objects of C to the objects of D and every morphism between X and Y to the morphisms between the images of X and Y. So it will also respect the identity and it will also re respect composition. So it will actually preserve the category, categorical structure. Uh, so we also have universal objects. So in a category, uh, let let us investigate one of his objects, and x. If if uh, from x to every y in that category, there is actually just one map, one morphism going from x to that y, then it will be called an initial object. So the for every y, uh, the set of uh, morphisms going from x to y will just be a single one. And terminal object is just where we reverse the process of y is actually one map going from y to x. And a zero object, if it is both initial and terminal. So these are actually unique up to unique isomorphism. This is a very easy theorem to prove, but uh, I don't have time. So these, this property actually what makes them universal. So they are unique up to unique isomorphism. This is very important in category theoretical construction. So, uh, some examples in the category of sets, for example, you can map the empty set with the empty function to any other set and it will be well-defined. Uh, so we have empty set as the initial object and you can map also every set to the uh, singleton. You can just map each of its elements to the singleton and there will exactly be one such function. So singleton will be the terminal object. And since these two can't be the same, then there are no zero objects. Okay, so since topological spaces are actually uh, sets with just topology induced on them, we want to, we expect this to be similar. similar. So uh, empty space is again the initial object and singleton with the trivial topology is terminal. You can prove that empty function is continuous and also the functions going to the singleton with trivial topology is also continuous. So uh, all the axioms are satisfied. Uh, and finally, let me talk about products. So in a category, when we have two objects, a product of them, here I denoted as Z, uh, will be such an object such that where there will be projection maps to A and B. And for any other C in that category with maps uh, going to A and B, there will be, sorry, there will be a unique morphism going from C to Z. So this map being unique makes this product universal actually. And also when we reverse all the errors, we have the idea of co-product. So then we will be having injection maps to A 
uh, to this co-product and B is also injected in this co-product. And for every S in this category, such that there are maps from A, A and B to S, there will actually be unique morphism going from this product to S. So as I said, this is actually just a definition of this joint union. Uh, I, I did also use the same symbol. Uh, so we can also say that in the category of sets or in the category of topological spaces, this joint union gives us the core product. Okay, so uh, let me talk about monoidal categories. So we have a category and we add these two things. We add a functor, uh, which takes the Cartesian products of these categories and maps it to something inside category. And a neutral object, which is usually denoted by one, that satisfies the associativity and neutral objects, x -ins. I didn't include them here because they're very long. Uh, so we will be denoting the monoidal category by this triple. And if there's a twist isomorphism such that when we reverse the uh, objects, places, then uh, they will be actually, uh, there will be an actually isomorphism between them. So our product B will be isomorphic to B product A. Then if And as you might expect, monoidal functor is a functor between two monoidal categories that preserves all the structure. So it commits with all the diagrams. Okay, examples. So any category that admits products is actually monoidal and natural object is the terminal object in case. So any category that admits co-products is also monoidal with initial object as natural. So I mentioned in topological spaces, this joint union gives us the co-product so with the initial object being the empty set, then we can say a topological space category uh, and the co-product and, and the empty set is actually a monoidal category. Okay, one of the most important monoidal categories is of course vector spaces. Uh, think of it with, it with tensor product and the field. Field here is the actually uh, initial object in this case. So of course tensor product satisfies the associativity axiom and there will be a twist map such that these two will be isomorphic. So vector spaces is actually a symmetric monoidal category. We have three minutes, Dara. Three minutes left. Okay, okay. So also we want to build the category of anchorboardisms. So uh, how do we do that? We need objects, morphisms, and composition. So we actually choose objects to be this n minus one close-oriented manifolds, and we choose morphisms to be the cobordisms between these two manifolds. And of, of course we have an identity which is a cylinder. I mentioned it before, but we also, we just have one problem, how do we compose them? So with cylinders is easy because when you uh, compose two cylinders, you again get a cylinder and you can choose the smooth structure to be the one coming from any cylinder. There is no problem. And, you know, when we talk about arbitrary cobordisms, there might be some problems, but with the use of Morse theory, uh, we take them equivalent to cylinders and then glue them just like cylinders. So uh, we encounter no problem. So this is how we denote uh, the Gluing. When we glue M0 and M1, we take their disjoint union under the equivalence relation on the common boundary point sigma 1. So we uh, glue them on sigma 1. Okay, so we uh, figured out how to glue them. So we have everything in order to uh, have a category. So let me summarize. Vector spaces are actually very familiar, so I will only go through cobordisms. So as objects, we have closed M minus 1 manifolds. As morphisms, we have N cobordisms between them. And we figured out how to compose this. Uh, we glue them under an equivalence relation. And the identity morphism is given by the cylinder cobordism. Monoidal product is the same as in, uh, the, in the case with uh, topological spaces, we have the disjoint union. And monoidal union is the empty manifold. So we can finally say a TQFT is a symmetric monoidal functor from N cobordisms to the vector spaces. So let us finally check that this is questions. So um, if you be careful, these three axioms, the first three axioms, A, B, and C, actually guarantees that TQFT is a functor. So it respects the identity, it sends it to the identity map, and it respects composition. So it's actually a functor. And the last two ones guarantees that it's a monoidal functor. So it sends the monoidal uh, product to the monoidal product of vector spaces, and it sends the natural object of the Cobordism category to the natural object of vector spaces, which is just the field. So uh, we can say this with just the one sentence. It's a symmetric monoidal function from this, between these two categories. So thank you all for listening. That will be all. Okay, so we thank our speaker.
So some reaction, so let's see. So any questions or comments? 